is focusing on exploring capabilities, applications, use cases of AI adoption in multiple industries, recoupled with recommending the AI journey roadmap across transformation and innovation. Today's theme is pretty interesting. Uh, it's around the overall AI analytics career stack and the opportunities now and beyond. If we talk about the future of uh, business, any business and career, it's it it is revolving around AI. Organizations cannot escape the impact of the overall uh, uh, pro proliferation of AI, which which it has brought, and uh, making yourself AI ready uh, in this whole economics of the world, in terms of the dynamics, in terms of the transformation, is something which every industry is looking into, and there as part of that. One of the key aspects which comes in is the overall career and learning. Students and professionals cannot escape the exposure to AI in their learning quotient. And while there are immense amount of opportunities which come in, the path to make yourself excel or uh, uh, be on the other side is specifically uh, full of complexity and ambiguity. And there uh, are attempt today in this session in this new uh, um, roundtable series is actually to decode these intricacies and look into what exactly lies behind AI and actually unravel what we call the X factor. Are you ready for the future uh, which AI prevails for you? So today's roundtable session will be anchored by a very seasoned AI leader. Uh, and it will also have some key representation from different uh, 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 marquee leaders in the AI industry. Uh, just to talk about the, the, the leader here, we have Naveen Yeri. Naveen Yeri has around over two decades of professional experience in data science, serving banking, insurance, information technology sectors. Uh, he has been a strategic thinker in terms of thinking into the vision, the actions, uh, how to maximize the overall shareholder value, or it is or also around the innovation piece, where specifically he has been looking into how we can blend the overall data analytics piece uh, into the data and the data science. Uh, Naveen Yeri also has been a keynote speaker at global conferences. Uh, and has spoken on the topics of data science uh, and, and other areas, uh, including analytic strategy and products, uh, uh, including business intelligence architecture, the risk awards, marketing optimization process excellence, to name a few. Uh, just to talk about the academic background of Naveen. Naveen, Naveen is a doctoral student in AI at Rennes School of Business, France. And he has also been a seasoned inventor with seven approved and 40 plus pending patents. So that's that's uh, uh, and as I speak about Naveen, I'm also overwhelmed with the achievement which he has done. Uh, I'll not spend my, uh, now more time just talking about it. I'll just hand over the mic to you, Naveen, to take it from here. Uh, I, along with the audience, are really looking forward to this session. Uh, and again, uh, a warm welcome to all of you uh, for this session. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you so much, Kapil, for the warm welcome. Uh, hopefully, I'm audible and there isn't an echo. Okay, perfect. So, thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, uh, folks, it's my honor uh, to host this uh, eminent panel and bring forth some of very, very important topics uh, uh, in, in front of you. So, uh, I'm actually super excited. Uh, to uh, bring in some thoughts and uh, spark some thoughts around with this panel who have uh, probably 130 plus years of professional experience collectively on this panel. And they call many schools their alma mater, uh, including IIT, IIMs, uh, Columbia University, Virginia Tech, uh, uh, around the world, what have you. And uh, many of these eminent folks uh, sit on the boards of uh, uh, the corporate and the academia and the industry boards. They also represent quite a number of uh, sectors, technology, banking, talent, academia, consulting. They are industry practitioners, thinkers, innovators, and above all, uh, uh, great speakers. So I would like to welcome, uh, uh, please give a virtual round of applause for this eminent panel, uh, Vijay Shivram, CEO of uh, Quest Corp, 
Sara Ramchandra, Director of uh, City, Dr. Amar Saxena, a professor at IIM Amritsar, Aparna Gupta, Leader of Analytics and Data Science at Oracle, Imran Saeed, Vice President at Course 5i. So, and I would like to extend a, a warm thank you to 3AI for bringing in experts and mainly connecting, uh, uh, connecting the experts uh, with the, the professionals around. So, uh, let's jump in. So, I will give a very quick uh, overview and also set up the stage. <clears throat> set up the stage here. Let's think about the marketplace. Uh, mar the, the current marketplace, uh, maybe we can best describe this as, um, you know, dynamic and emerging, right? And fast changing and unpredictable. And the new opportunities for technology, business practices and innovation is being disrupted and coming to the forefront. So, uh, importantly, there are three things happening at, in, in my mind. Uh, number one is sectors are merging. So when you think about travel industry, you see advertisements where uh, the, the travel uh, resorts are uh, shaking hands with the, the hospitals and the healthcare to give you peace of mind. That's number one. Jewelry and fashion executives show up at your doorstep for convenience. So there are a number of uh, sectors that are merging and as uh, professionals, we need to be thinking about how the dynamics of uh, how this is changing, right? Number two is technology is coming to the forefront uh, very rapidly. The edge computing, uh, you know, uh, we all have smartphones and the data thereof uh, is being consumed very, very vigorously. The first call, mobile phone call was made in 1995 from Kolkata to, De to Delhi. And now India is the second largest consumer of uh, smartphones. So the third thing is, uh, I think what is cliched right now is the better, faster, and cheaper is now a thing of past. So what's emerging now is customers are seeking very contextual responses from companies. So they want the companies to be smart. While on the other hand, the corporates are thinking about, hey, can I get the instantaneous feedback so that I can be better and be uh, very reactive uh, to the customers? But what, what that is emerging here is that we are in a continuously connected economy. So folks, when, when these market forces are um, out there, as professionals, how do you think that uh, one needs to chart our career? Because there is quite a bit of emphasis on whatever I talked about in the last three minutes or so, there is this smart thing happening, which is the AI. So the engine that is powering all of this is AI. So how do we need to be ready? So I uh, uh, had the privilege to ask uh, the, uh, very nice questions and we will hear from the best of the best. Um, and uh, how do we think about continual learning? Can we learn AI at school or master some courses or you know, keep uh, plugging away on the job and get uh, uh, better at it and learn AI? So we will we'll double click on that more. Most importantly, I would like you all to think about how does AI cracks learn, think, and execute? Is there something called an AI mindset? So we will probe some questions on this panel and uh, uh, bring some of the thoughts uh, together. So for this panel format, we are, we are thinking about three uh, sections. We will start with bust the myth. Let's uh, we'll think about certain stereotypes and we'll ask experts how uh, they well, whether the bust the myth or carry on with that. The second thing is bet on the best. Uh, I would like each of the panelists to talk about their experience uh, and unfold uh, uh, something and something uh, awesome that can connect with all of you. And the third is we will ask for the best advice ever that these mentors have gotten from their mentors. So please wait for that. I'm sure we all are in for a fantastic ride. All right, uh, without further ado, we will go on to the first section. It's called the bust, the myth. And I will I would request all the panelists to introduce themselves as uh, uh, they get the quote unquote microphone, if you will. So first, uh, let me uh, uh, pick Sarah. Uh, Sarah, the myth here is no one's an expert yet. AI is so broad from data engineering to polystructured data analytics to NLP, ML, uh, uh, you know, reinforcement learning, deep learning, what have you. There's always some complementarity 
that one needs to understand. No one's an expert yet. What's your take? Thank you, Arik, uh, Navin. That's actually the um, right statement to uh, talk about, right? Um, to think of AI expert is such a such a myth, and uh, maybe Navin, let me introduce myself first, and then uh, and then I'll take the question. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Saraswati, uh, known in my friend circle and professional circle as Sarah. Uh, been with the industry for 23 years now have moved from technology to consulting to um, uh, into captive industry, done various roles in the last 23 years that I've worked. And all of these, I consciously took a, a decision to unlearn whatever I've learned and relearn, right? So started with technology and then moved to products and then moved to captive. Um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed each one of them because I don't like status quo. So when I just completely jump into com something new is where I am making sure my graces are not dead. And uh, I um, started with mainframe long time back and then moved to middleware and then moved to analytics. That's been my journey. Worked with, with several companies right now with Citibank. Um, have done global roles, have led global teams across multiple countries and been leading uh, analytics teams responsible for uh, driving the uh, business outcomes across multiple markets. Um, I've done my master's from Bitsbilani in computer science and also have done my MBA from uh, Symbiosis in international business. I believe in continuous learning and uh, whether it is on job or on uh, paper. So if if not anything else, right now I'm learning Sanskrit just to go back to the roots. So um, back to the question that Naveen asked. I think if somebody comes in an interview or in a CV, if somebody writes I'm an expert in AI field, I would be very wary of such person. Um, those are the ones that I would not proceed with confidence, even they are, even if they are master in something, um, because there is no AI expert. Um, often, you know, we do think just writing a code or writing, uh, uh, developing a model makes us an AI expert. Unfortunately, it's not right. There are so many various substreams within within AI. And it takes years to master one specific substream. And if we just look at how many basic elements that are there, right? There's maths, there's stats, and there is business knowledge that is so key to what we do. Data understanding, um, programming skills and capabilities, and also a lot of research that needs to go on. And like I said, also continuous learning because it's an ever-changing field. And to imagine one is an expert at all of these things is such a uh, myth. The reason why we have a team and the team has complementary skill set in any team that is composed of is because one cannot be master of all. Right? So if we have a business problem and if you need to solve it, we have data scientists, we have data analysts, we have data architects or data engineers and visualization experts. And the precise reason is because you cannot be master at everything. And AI itself is a field which is ever changing. Uh, fundamentals remain the same though, but you know, it's fast, uh, changing uh, ever faster than uh, before. So it takes at least five, six months before you move on to the next topic itself. So the way I look at it, Naveen, is if you think you're a traveler, uh, and map it to the AI journey. There are three ways to look at your traveling, right? One, you go to just visit a place and come back. One, you just go as a backpacker and uh, explore the whole journey. The other one is you just reach the destination, stay in a place and come back. If you want to be an AI um, expert in any field, you need to explore every single element, right? It's a, it's a journey who is meant to be an explorer part of it. Uh, you cannot be an expert in anything unless you are, uh, if you are just visiting there and, uh, you know, just thinking I have, I know 
to code in Python now is not going to make anybody an expert. And if I look at the whole universe of um, AI or any specific thing, right? If I look at uh, universe as a circle, and if the circle has is divided into three corners or four corners, and if I just map it to Johari window and say, okay, what is it that, what do I know in this whole universe, right? It just maps to 0.001%. And that's how little we know of this whole thing of AI universe. And if I just say, okay, I don't know CNN, right? I need to learn. That's something that I know I don't know I need to learn. But what I don't, don't know is about 98% out there. So if I just draw a pie chart or a you know circle and divide it, what I don't know, I don't know, is a huge element in this whole AI universe, right? And it's a never-ending journey. So what I would say is, you know, it's on us to go understand what is our strength and go get familiar with the data. Data comprises, data is a huge element of the AI journey. Go where the data goes. AI is nothing without data. It's like having a talent, raw talent, right? Understanding data and delivering insights is quintessential part of the whole journey. And then also understanding business domain. Um, see far too many people saying, you know, I am, I've got AI skills um, that I've done a project on, but if there's no domain expertise involved, uh, it, is, it is inevitable that the outcome is not going to be very successful. So understanding the domain and uh, is very, very key element as well. And really understanding the problem statement, right? That's that's where we start with. And anybody who's aspiring to get there, I would suggest that they take on the projects, get into competitive spirit, take part in competition. There's GitHub competition, create a portfolio, right? If you have a portfolio that shows that you are invested in it, you have created something, and you can talk about what business problem they have solved. Uh, it's not about, again, it's not about tool. It's not about Python. It's not about um, SaaS. It's not about the tool. It's a much larger universe that we are talking about. And very key element, uh, like how I started, is also you need to be aware of what's happening in this industry, what's happening in this world. Uh, what's happening in this universe because it's an ever changing universe and you need to be a constant learner. Read all the literature you can about what's happening. Uh, it's a very important skill if you want to be on the top of everybody else in this race. Unlike other established, like Java, right? It's been there. Everybody knows what to do, right? AI is nowhere close to that. It's evolving. So you need to evolve with that. And most important element, I think, is also having the right mentor. In my whole journey, I've had several mentors. So I shifted from technology to analytics, right? And that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have the right guide, a right mentor who's, who told me what needs to be done, who told me how I need to approach and solve the problem, small, take it as small, uh, you know, achievement, small success, and celebrate some of these to reach where I have to reach. So having that mentor, having that network professional, uh, professional network is a very key element as well. Um, now, I mean, those were my thoughts. I don't know if I covered everything that you wanted me to. Absolutely. I think uh, those were really uh, resonant thoughts. And uh, one thing is for sure, whenever I travel, I will uh, ask your advice next. So which one of the three types that you mentioned I, that I should be picking up on? Sarah, we'll come back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will switch over to Amar. So Amar, the, the myth here is that uh, academia is always in a catch-up mode. The industry has gone further away. But when we think about uh, the, the best of the best, the cutting edge research happens in academia. Where is the divide? And how do you see it? And you you have been a practitioner, uh, uh, you know, in the industry as well as in the academician. So would love to get your thoughts and with a short introduction of yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naveen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity as well. A little bit of a brief introduction about me. I have around 23 years of experience. 
was in the industry earlier. I started off my journey with the marketing research industry where I was with the WPP group. Later on, moved into analytics with, uh, with GE at their analytics center of excellence. Uh, and a host of things. You know, broadly speaking, I've been in the banking uh, and financial services space. Been on both sides of the part. You know, one is the in-house company as well as the consulting organizations as well on both parts of it. And over the last five years now, I have been with academics. So I realized that after a certain point in time, you know, in corporate world, I was becoming more of a firefighter rather than, you know, learning. And analytics, there is so much happening almost every day. There's something new happening. Um, so I'm shifted over here currently with Iron Omni. So that's a little bit of a short background about me. Coming to the part that you have said, you know, academia, I will say it's actually a little interesting thing. If you really look at many of the advances that have happened in the computing world, like the map reduced technology or the other thing, they have actually been brought about by academicians, by students who are doing the PhD and working with them. But if you look at the other side, like right now when I'm teaching, that is where am I really, you know, the main question that I keep on asking myself when I'm taking a class or when I'm teaching analytics, business analytics or marketing analytics in my subjects, I really feel that am I at the cutting edge or not? And I continuously need to be there. So this is actually a little bit of a conundrum where a lot of the good things are happening there. But again, there are a lot of the things where there is missing. If I were to take a step back and take a look at it, I will say at a strategic level, possibly the academicians, you know, the academic industry, uh, people in the academics rather have a lot to offer there. They have a very fine mind and they bring that thing as well. You know, they are not cluttered by whatever is going on in the industry. They have a little bit of an uncluttered mind. Plus the focus on research also is there where they are trying to see the gaps between whatever is existing right now. So they are kind of, you know, tuned in to do that. But when you come to the tactical level, that is where probably there is, a, they are missing a beat there. And why is that really happening? If I were to take a punt and if I were to take a shot at it, you know, the reason is that academia and industry, there is a big gulf separating the two. There is, they are, you know, kind of living in a different universe. At least in India, it is happening this way. There are some countries like, for example, US. There, you know, my co-panelists will probably, you know, are better suited for that. But whatever I have seen of it, you know, I really realize that academia and industry are much more in closer association. If you look at US, for example, in India, the Gulf is quite a lot. So that is where, when I am actually teaching my students, the main question that I keep on asking myself is, am I teaching something which is relevant? Why is this question very important in AI field right now? And the reason is very simple. The reason is there is so much happening right now in the industry. There is so much innovation happening that if I probably don't read or don't study for one week, I'm starting to get outdated. And that is extremely important. So you have to have one feet right there in the industry. And that is where probably this gulf starts separating the two. Uh, and this is so one of the things I would also say, you know, a side note on that, given the pace of the change of this industry right now, I will say that the one thing which is constant in the future world is that prepare yourself for a continuous learning journey. If you think that I have done my master's, I've done, you know, my learning is over, you are very badly mistaken. For example, I'll, I asked very simple question to my students. Last year was a complete lockdown. How many courses, how many MOOC courses did you do last year? Isn't it? You have to be there. So those would be my thoughts. In nutshell, if I were to summarize, at a strategic level, probably academicians have a lot to offer, but at a tactical level, I think industry has to support with the academics because they are they, those are the grooming grounds, the breeding grounds for the talent. And that is where I believe that there should be a very strong cooperation between industry and academics right now probably that is not happening hope that answers thank you, you, thank, know, you. And, yeah. uh, thank you yeah. you very well brought together a few geographic uh, uh, color to it as well as the pace of learning and the pace of the industry which uh, segues into my next question uh, to vijay 
So uh, Amar talked about the pace of uh, learning has to be uh, very, very quick. And uh, as professionals, we always look for, hey, can I just, uh, you know, take baby steps and just uh, master one thing, uh, Python or uh, the basics of statistics or uh, some algorithm. And, uh, uh, you know, can I just put it on my resume? So the myth here that I want to talk about is, professionals are hungry for quick certification courses and how does the industry react to it and you are in the talent management industry and you are the best person uh, to give an opinion on that so with a brief introduction Vijay please hi I mean thank you so much it's an absolute pleasure to be among all of you and as well as all the audience members out here uh, so as an introduction I founded co-founded an organization called Questcom uh, I still work there. It's uh, I started in 2007. Today, we are India's largest private employer. But one of the largest businesses we do is uh, in workforce, where we provide talent in different forms, either through recruiting as a service or contractual hiring as such. So, yeah, uh, somewhere at the bottom of my heart, yeah, we, Naveen, I'm a recruiter. So, uh, to your point, I think I'll just catch on to uh, the learning journey that I'm And I love the word learn. Um, I think... The concept or the, not the the fact of knowing is out of the window. If you want to know something, there's Google. But for everything else, you need to learn. I think short-term courses in itself uh, has a natural ability to know stuff. But you may not necessarily learn. It's like the good old days when we all grew up, we mugged up stuff. And uh, that became a need uh, and later, when we wanted to remember it, we had no clue because we had mugged up things and stuff like that. So I think today is a world of learning, and I use this coinage quite a bit. Learning to learn itself is a key problem. Many of the people around us today have forgotten how to learn. We believe to think as that if we have to log in, we have to read books, we have to uh, study a lot, listen to a lot of uh, professors may not always be enterprising, it's boring. I've got work. I'd rather do that. At least that's paying me and stuff like that. I think first you have to learn to learn and know how to get used to the fact, like Amar was saying, just keeping it as part of your objective every year. And and I and I like going back to the point that you know a goal without a plan is just a wish. So if every single employee or a candidate is looking for a job, um, the job is just a path to achieve to go somewhere else. It's just a pathway. So somewhere, if you don't know where you want to eventually go, uh, you're never going to learn enough to reach there. So uh, throwing out the no, uh, I have candidates attending interviews today and writing code through Google. You know, when they answer the code on the interview virtually, they're actually Googling the codes parallelly. So it kind of puts myself into doubt that have they actually learned it before? So my uh, uh, two cents to your point, Naveen, is uh, to le learning to learn. And making sure that, you know, if you have a goal, uh, know the journey and what courses are required to achieve. Some may be short. I'm not saying all short courses are bad. I think there are some bridge courses that people have to take because it might be complementary to what they do or supplementary to what they do. So I, I definitely think short courses is not a bad thing. And it's always good to have these things as part of your uh, curriculum vitae or your profile. Uh, but it should somewhere at the bottom align to your larger goal as to where you want to go. Um, uh, you might be a Netflix expert, but if that's not going to take you where you want to go, no point putting it in your resume. Very well said, uh, Vijay. And I really like the balance that you are inspiring our audience and including all of us uh, to have uh, with the short term and the long term and don't keep it as separate. It's a continual thread. So those are the pearls of necklaces that you, you'll have to define on your own. So. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vijay. And actually, which leads us uh, to the next uh, myth that I have for Imran. Imran, I think, uh, uh, you know, when when uh, there are sinusoidal waves in the uh, economy, there are certain hot pockets where the uh, job market just attracts the masses. Maybe it was uh, the e-commerce or the IT uh, servicing, and we called it as big data and now artificial intelligence. But there is always uh, a, a divide uh, between, you know, where, where people would go and, uh, you know, how do they gear, for, gear up for it? So my question or the myth here is specifically in the AI area, demand for data engineers will supersede compared to data analysts. 
you know one you know there would be one report saying uh, one way the other report saying the other way so you have been in the in this industry as well as uh, uh, you know across different continents what's your take on this one and brief introduction to lead us off please sure thanks uh, thanks Naveen. Uh, i think a, a insightful piece was coming in from uh, all the other people as well so a uh, quick background uh, spent close to about uh, 21 uh, years in the in the industry uh, started off with uh, doing something of my own uh, and that was a learning and an unlearning as well when i started a, a dot com uh, back in 97 in 2001 and then busted uh, so i thought okay this is not uh, the time for me to be an entrepreneur and uh, grow like perhaps uh, you know, Vijay has. So I said, okay, let me get back into the, uh, you know, uh, job market, uh, learn. Uh, so I joined GE, spent a good five years with them, uh, HSBC, uh, enjoyed working with Amar there. And then over the last 14 years, I was part of an analytics uh, with Absolute Data. And then now we exited and uh, joined Course 5, uh, you know, to charter new pieces. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, to what like Amar said, I I felt there was this gulf, and and I spent some time, uh, and I continue to, one obviously learn uh, and unlearn myself uh, at at Columbia uh, Business School, uh, but then also an active participation with the uh, Rutgers Business School, where uh, I try to bridge this gap of the industry and the academia, so that you know we, we the programs are more, far more uh, you know ready to. A deploy and and you know makes people uh, far more uh, richer in an experiential way rather than just more uh, theoretical. So yeah, so that's uh, who I am. Um, love to share and experiment uh, and and an entrepreneur and in, in some aspect. Uh, and I think that's the reason analytics and AI continues to uh, you know be a challenging piece because it never stops, right? And you cannot be an AI expert. I think if you cannot be an intelligence expert. Forget about being an artificial intelligence expert, right? I mean, uh, we, we, I don't think anybody is an intelligent expert if we can if we can call out. So uh, coming, uh, you know, onto the myth that you said, and uh, you know, some people who have worked with me or have heard me or read me in, in, in some of the articles that I that I post, I believe. You know, the condom of people saying, oh, data engineering is, is more important or no, data science is more important. And to me is, if you, if you are to step back a little bit and saying, what is it that these two folks and people and roles are trying to do? And it's about solving a business question. So the importance of both of them lie in how easy it is to solve the business question. And I think a very clear example to look at it is in, in today's world, and, and I'm sure it touches every participant uh, who will be there in our, in our, in our uh, session today, is Google Maps. Is it being built by data engineers? Is it being built by data science guys? Or is it being built by design thinkers? It's so simple. Your objective is I need to go from point A and to point B, and in, in between, there will be a roadblock, so please guide me to the next best alternative route. All three need to come in to be able to give that seamlessly end solution. And I think that's often at times we miss out. And hence we say, oh no, data engineering is more important, but well, you can't do data engineering if, if you don't have a great aspects of data science. And if you have even these two things, if you're not thinking from a solution design perspective, it's it's not going to help in the adoptability part. Today, why Google Maps is perhaps, and, and I don't want to be quoted on it, but is more adopted than Apple Maps is because it, it's far more intuitive, it's far more user friendly. So, so to me is it's a, you know, these two and there are other profiles as well, which have a fairly equal importance it is about oneself of which direction they want to build up into. But at the same time, one should not, as you're going through and what Sarah mentioned, it's a journey, right? So when you're moving in that journey towards it, you need to explore and touch all these three or four different roles to be able to bring out the importance and to understand where you need them. 
because at the end of the day, it is you need it as a as a team. So as you're going through the journey, I would urge, and and that's what I did. I mean, I I later on move into more of a of a business consulting role, and prior to that, did data science, and then prior to that, did data engineering. Uh, but one should touch upon all of these to be able to then move into a, a journey or a place where you are approaching towards an experienced AI professional. I wouldn't still call it as an AI expert because by the time you reach there, there will be a few more things that, that will come up. But uh, if you want to be experienced in that, you've got to touch those and you know they're all equally uh, important and have an important role to play. Imran, wonderful. Uh, I think uh, the customer centricity that you are trying to bring in and also inspiring the audience to keep the business in mind and not the tools is, is uh, absolutely resonating. So thank you so much. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, Aparna. Aparna, uh, the previous four myths have been around the what, and now I'd like to slightly shift around the how of it. So uh, I quote uh, Simon Sinek, and uh, one of the management gurus uh, and uh, in in one of the videos he talks about how millennials have been changing uh, their perspective and and uh, you know whichever uh, demographic profile that you are in it is applicable the key thing that he talks about is that the error of limited patience we as consumers we as you know parents professionals friends, whoever, we, we are lacking patience as we go through this because we want quick answers. We want our smartphones to provide quick uh, uh, directions, smart speakers to tell uh, where we want to go. And uh, as professionals, very quickly, we want to raise up to the next level. I want you to double click on the patients from your uh, uh, standpoint. And again, with, with a brief introduction, please, Aparna, over to you. Thanks, Naveen. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here as part of this eminent panel. And uh, I, I would like to extend my gratitude to 3AI team as well for organizing such a wonderful session. Now, in terms of, okay, so uh, I'll start off with my introduction. I started off my career in 2007. I am basically an engineering graduate and alumni of IIIT Bangalore as well as I am Bangalore. I believe in continuous learning and in my short career of 13 years, 13, oh, yeah, close to 13 years, I have worked with uh, Oracle, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, and Infosys. So I have a diverse set of experience and understanding from the banking domain, as well as now in the product-based organization. Yeah, so, so that's a brief about me. Now, when we come about, when we talk about uh, courses, which are short term, there must be a plethora of courses, myriad of courses, which are available online. And it's a tendency of people to go ahead and then go through those courses, enroll themselves in those courses. While those courses can help us to help them to provide a quick primer on what the machine learning or analytics or artificial intelligence is. Getting into the skin of it, becoming a master of it requires time, requires time and patience both the both the stuffs. I can be a Python expert. I, I can say that, you know, I can be a Python expert maybe in one year, two year, three years time as an, you know, as I evolve basically, but in terms of getting a domain expert, I really need to invest some time in that. The short term courses will provide you the topics, will provide the uh, concepts basically. Yes, this is how it works, but more important is it to understand that how these concepts can be implemented in the real time scenarios. There's a very famous, uh, uh, in, in the marketing world basically, right? Everyone is uh, out, out there marketing. So when we talk about marketing attribution, many a times we use regression or many a times we use Markov models. But do we actually know that which model is performing better? Or regression can be applied in which all scenarios? Or Markov chain can be implied in which all scenarios? So in coupling it with the domain is what will make the difference. We get a lot, I get a lot of resumes basically where they say they have done this course from XYZ portal or this particular academy and many, many such things basically. But it, when it comes to the interview, when it comes, when, it, when we ask them, okay, can you explain what is a sigmoid function? Or when we ask them, what can you explain? Where do you actually impl implement the concordant or disconcordant pair? Probably they're clueless. 
And that is because the lack of expertise, the lack of experience in that domain. The domain expertise is very much crucial to the AI and analytics field. It will help us to make the sense of the data. We all read newspapers in some form. It could be online or offline mode. When we look at the charts, do we are we able to make sense of that data? I think that is the question everyone needs to answer that. And that will come only with, uh, with experience and considerable investment in terms of understanding the domain. The other aspect is also about the design thinking. I think Amar and, Im and uh, Imran also highlighted this thing, customer centricity. Whenever we are solving the problem, whenever we are tackling a business uh, you know, challenge, are we thinking from the customer's point of view? AI is nothing if you're not able to uh, provide efficiency and provide do some good for the society. Eventually, the end objective is to provide automation, provide efficiency, and do some kind of good for the overall society. So from that perspective, I think that design thinking uh, approach is also needed. And that customer empathy and all will come only, only if I get into customer shoes and understand that what the domain is, what the entire landscape is, what the entire ecosystem is of data, what are the various nuances of the data, which parameters are important. I cannot decide this only with a short term course, which is just of a month or two months or maximum, you know, maybe by three months, basically. I can only solve these things the more I have real time experience into solving these issues. So, yeah, so this is, uh, you know, my my brief, uh, my two cents on this thing that uh, short term courses are good to start off with, but uh, it is up to us how we how much we implement and only implementation and expertise over a period of time will make us the must will at least, you know, lead us towards the excellence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the way I'm uh, interpreting it is you're saying have patience. Yes, yes of course. <laughs> All right, thank you. And thank you so much uh, you know, for the panelists for a great uh, first round. And it uh, looks like some myths are true and some uh, need a little bit of color and commentary. So uh, like in life, it, it the famous uh, quote, right? It all depends. So we'll, we'll uh, 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 take that uh, forward. So let's go on to Theme two or round two. Everybody ready? Analysts? All right, awesome. So uh, uh, let me start with uh, Vijay. Uh, this time we'll mix it up. Uh, and uh, uh, Vijay, uh, I, as I get to know him, uh, he's an avid traveler and I asked him, which is your top destination? And he says Athens, Greece. So Vijay, uh, I haven't been there, but I would love to. And I'll call you for a, a good itinerary. Uh, so, and also, I should mention that he's a first day, first show Rajnikanth fan. So, uh, <laughs> I have made a list, huge list of uh, Rajnikanth questions, but maybe for a, uh, a different uh, panel. But today, we will concentrate on uh, AI, uh, Vijay. So, uh, the, the, the question that I have is, uh, what do companies look for in a prospective workforce in data science and AI? Do they look at role-based, hey, here is something that I need and I need people, or would they transform uh, around and say, let me bring on the, the best uh, of folks with skills, and we all know that we don't have ready-made experts in AI. Uh, which uh, side does the pendulum tilt? I would love for your take on this one. Interesting. I'll give you a one-line answer to start with, Ramin. All hiring managers want Rajnikanth. But unfortunately, that cannot be possible. So I'll try to now explain it in a little, from a recruiter fashion or from a hiring manager fashion, et cetera. So uh, you brought up uh, the point of role-based and person-defined as such, you know. I think most job descriptions are always focused on the role. And uh, in many ways, I would say not even the entire role, maybe 50% of the actual role as such. But in today's world, what is happening and why, uh, how much ever AI we put in and uh, there is a hiring manager need. So like I think Aparna mentioned that there is an end goal, a customer journey that you want to, uh, there's an outcome that you want to achieve. And therefore, every hiring manager also wants to achieve that end goal for his company. And so there's always um, the fact that every job position will have a person definition for that role. Now, many a time when candidates and when people are looking for jobs, 
they assume that what is written on the job description is the job that's going to be there. I think uh, I've always advised and suggested candidates saying that you know while you must of course know what the job description says and what the company is all about and the culture is all about, it is very important to also know the person interviewing you. You have LinkedIn today. You don't need any other resource. Just LinkedIn alone will tell you the background of the person that's going to interview what his background comes from, what is his strengths, what is his interest. When I look into Naveen's LinkedIn profile, I know he's worked with IBM. I know he's worked with Bank of America. He's worked in North Carolina. It kind of puts across conversation builders to bring confidence into the interview. And then you start slowly realizing when you go through the LinkedIn profile, you start realizing, okay, he's strong in this area. If you're not strong, then don't try to push too much towards that. Try to focus on your strengths and try to see where you find alignment with your hiring manager. So I think while role definition as a job description and what the recruiting teams tells you is very important, I'm not denying that, I'm not taking that away. It's also very important for each candidate resource to do your own research, some amount of work on who's hiring you, who's looking at you, and what's the culture of the organization? What is their, uh, how do they look at things like people management, diversity, uh, growth, are people growing in the same function? It'll help you manage the interview. So I think to your point, Naveen, I think just role definition of what is written in the JD is possibly just a very small part of the interview process. I hope that helps. Absolutely. I think you are uh, hinting more towards keep an open mind and uh, don't have too many blinders as you get into the interviews uh, and uh, be open to adapt. Uh, thank you so much, Vijay. And also, uh, I, I always uh, liked my LinkedIn counts and thank you for upping that number yesterday. <laughs> All right, uh, we will move over to Imran. Uh, Imran, I have a C-suite uh, question. When analysts, AI uh, practitioner, data scientists uh, picks up on a project, there are two facets that we are, we are confounded with. One, uh, you know, the, the top level leadership always says, hey, get me the answer. Tell me uh, the bottom line, the so what, how many dollars ROI. But the analysts and the AI professionals are uh, thinking about where do I get the data? How do I massage it? What models do I use? Is, uh, uh, is, the, uh, is the output sane enough? So again, there is a divide here at a mess of expectations. So what should uh, professionals think about uh, in the spirit of AI to get to the so what? Okay. So I'll share uh, three things, you know, that uh, over the course of my journey through, uh, you know, I, I experienced it and I, and I was told as well. So the first is the ability to break down the question or the problem that I'm solving at. I think we have a habit, and I think uh, Aparna did, uh, or, or you alluded to that on the earlier theme, which is the patience, right? So, so we tend to go and jump onto the solution part of it. And I think that's where we often you know, fall off because I've done a solution and I'm like, oh, but this is not what was asked uh, by the C-suite or by my senior leaders. And, and that is because we don't try to break down it into smaller steps. And because if we are able to do that, we will be able to, you know, ride through that journey and be able to uh, dwell in it better and also answer that so what aspect that uh, that comes across towards the end. So I think the first is build up the capability and learn the capability to break down uh, problems into, into smaller area, uh, aspects part of it. How to do that? And I think that's one thing that somebody had taught me is, uh, and, and it happens very regularly actually in the, in the consulting organizations and uh, McKinsey perhaps does the most, is a, com a concept, and I'm sure Amar would be teaching that as well, of uh, creating and building issue trees. You know, where you start off with, with a big question, say, okay, what is the end impact going to be like? And that end, end impact is what the C-suite wants, right? Top line, bottom line, shareholder value. But then it cannot come with a want. 
you know, we're not sitting in a Harry Potter where we can, you know, swing the wand and, and get it. So then start breaking those questions out and try to really spend time on creating that issue tree. It's, it's uh, not easy, but that will help. And I think the third piece, which, which somebody had uh, been also told me as, as one of my mentors, the simplest thing is the most complex thing. So when you're trying to build up this issue tree, at the first start, you'll be like, oh, this is very easy. I know three questions, this is the data that I want. And But trust me, sit down on your laptop or on a piece of paper and try to curate this issue tree. I still take time in doing that. And about 20, 20 years of experience, right? So I think with a, a two month certification or a, or a five year course, you will still need more time to do that. So. These are the three things which which I think will will help. Uh, break down. How will you break down the pieces? Is issue tree, and it's simple, but to me that's the most uh, complex thing. And and I hope I tried to answer your question in a more easy manner in an issue tree manner. <laughs> Imran, you kept it very simple. Let me just say that. <laughs> very awesome. Uh, in fact, I'm uh, I'm I'm. So glad that I'm soaking in, I'm enjoying it. And, and uh, as a, uh, hopefully the audi audience, you guys are uh, enjoying this uh, uh, absorption as well. So Imran, thank you. We will move over to our avid marathoner, Amar. Uh, you, you looks like you moved into Amritsar very uh, earlier this year and you're loving the weather. That's uh, what I hear. Uh, my question to you is, uh, we know that the pace of change is tremendous. The pace of learning is uh, is in a catch-up mode. We just discussed about that. The other factor that I would like to bring in is, nowadays, the knowledge, knowledge sources are quote-unquote free. 10, 20, 30 years ago, you had to uh, visit a library or uh, you know borrow a book from someone, but we have a knowledge uh, at our fingertips. At the same time, it comes in uh, the concept of quality, which knowledge is can be consumed uh, by how much. So can you please uh, talk about that? And, and also, how do learners identify quality content? And also, what is what, what should be the speed of assimilation? So if you could double click on that, it will be awesome. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, running is actually now becoming the new golf, isn't it? You find so many people around you who are into this, and definitely it's one of the sports which I love. Um, the weather, actually, you know, in Bombay right now, it's raining quite a lot, and that's a perfect weather. But anyway, coming back to it, see, one of the things which the world that we are living in, one, if anybody were to say to me that I know what the world will look like in the next three years, five years or so, he doesn't know a clue about what he is saying. That's the, so the only thing which is constant is that tomorrow is going to be different. And the problem is that it's going to be, it is so uncertain that I really don't know what to do. And this is where when students actually talk to me and say, what should we really be doing and what are the, I said, while the future is uncertain, the main thing that you have to work with is are you able to handle uncertainty? How will you handle uncertainty? And that is where there are a few key skills which are required. The most important critical skill is really about the critical thinking. And one of the examples that I keep, keep on using, and I'll use it here also, is you take the leaders in any industry, say the business industry or the acting industry, sports industry, whichever industry, the people who are the leaders, the one common theme among all of them is that they were significantly superior thinkers. In fact, take the criminal industry also. The criminals that we remember are the ones who are superior thinkers. And so if there is one quality, not thinking, oh, we all are thinkers, you know, we all think. Do you think? Ask that question yourself. It's a very simple thing as Amran used, as, you know, to paraphrase what Imran I also use that term. it's very simple technique, very easy technique, but it's actually very difficult to master. 
So that is one thing which I will say, if you have a thinking mind, you will definitely be doing very good. And that kind of boils down to, you know, there, one of the things which is extremely important and earlier Sarah also had touched upon it, that the world is becoming so complex that for one person to know everything is literally impossible. That is why you look at the different data science COEs. They have, you know, now they are starting to come up with, okay, one data science COE head might not be good enough. There needs to be two people because these aspects, these functions will be taken care of by this person. So there is actually an evolution in that model itself. Probably Vijay will be able to throw more light. He's in touch with that. But what I'm saying is, one of the important things for a person is networking. How strong a network you have is extremely important and critical to your success. Thinking ability, networking. Ultimately, it boils down to your attitude. Your attitude determines your attitude. A very cliched saying, but I'll repeat it. You know, and these so earlier I had said the learning thing which is there, and now I will say, you know, that it's like you know, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. So there are so many learning resources available for you all around the place. Do you, have you done the thinking yourself that these are the things which I want to take? The learner know where the shoe, the wearer know where the shoe pinches. You have to decide your own learning journey. You have to have that learning thing. You have, if you are not clear about it, talk to other people. Network, try to find out from people. But that attitude is extremely important. And if you have the right attitude, if you have that flexible attitude, you'll definitely be able to handle the future, which is highly uncertain. I don't know if I've been able to, just trying to share my point of view here, you know, Naveen. Those are amazing uh, perspectives, Amar. In fact, if I'm, if, I, if I'm taking away a coat for my next T-shirt, I will say that, do you think with, check, with a question mark? So that'll be a reminder for me and uh, everyone else who, who looks at me. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks for that uh, quote. All right, so next we'll go over, over to our Sanskrit scholar, Sarah. And uh, Sarah, I will, uh, I have picked, actually, uh, you have helped me pick, I should be uh, very honest here, with the Subhashita. With the, uh, and I will quote that and I would like you to explain what it means. So uh, it's a Sanskrit question, if you will. Kasya doshaha kule nasti vyadhina kona piditaha vyasanam kena na praptam kasya saukhyam nirantaram. Can you please explain that and how it relates to uh, this audience today? Sorry, 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 sorry for the background. If you are hearing the dog bark about, can't do anything about it, Navi. Uh, thank you, thank you for the Sanskrit quote. So that's my new fad now, uh, obviously, because somewhere I want to make sure I'm going back to the roots, right? So that's where um, the Sanskrit is definitely helping me. Uh, just to what you quoted, I, essentially what it's saying is in whose house there is no problem. Who in this world doesn't have health issues? Who in this uh, world is forever happy, right? So there is always problems, but focus on what you think is right and achieve the goal, right? Goes back to what we also discussed in multiple pockets uh, across is there is no one single solution. There is no one uh, expert. Uh, there is problem everywhere, but I think we need to leverage our strengths to be able to solve these problems and win over these problems. That's essentially the meaning of that shloka in crux. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, that's a wonderful explanation, Sarah. Appreciate that. All right, uh, we will go to Aparna. And we need to speed up a little bit. I think we need to catch up sometime. There are questions that are flowing in as well. Um, so Aparna, the question uh, here is that uh, you cannot separate out AI with data. So they are so blended together. One needs to have an equal amount of appreciation, depth of knowledge, and how to handle uh, each of these facets. When we think about data, we have, there are some softer aspects of it, like accountability, transparency, and fairness of information, that uh, ethics as well. So all of us need to inculcate it, ingrain it, put it in our hard disk, indelible. What's your take and what's your advice uh, for our professionals uh, in the audience here. 
Sure, Naveen. I think diversity and inclusion has become one of the hot topic like data science. So every company, every corporate sector, and even um, academics are also, you know, focusing on diversity of thoughts and diversity and inclusivity of those thoughts. So when we talk about uh, any any technology that we are developing, the technology we are developing is for today and tomorrow. So it is extremely it is imperative that we include all sets of data. Generally, for the data scientists, we just they are just dumped with an Excel sheet or they are just with, dumped with uh, you know with a set of data basically. But do they know that where the data is coming from? Are we using which kind of sampling uh, are we using? Are we getting the data from all corners of the world? So, getting the diverse set of data, having the inclusivity of the thoughts of the various developers, and it's a it, it will be a journey. It is because bias and uh, and you know stereotyping can creep at any stage. You you see about Alexa, you see about Cortana, you see about Siri. All have been named as female. So maybe you know a wider view, a diverse thought process of uh, uh, the developers will help us to see the world from the broader uh, broader lens and will help us to identify these biases at the early stage and fix them there are various techniques which are available in machine learning to identify and fix this bias what is more important is that how cognizant are we how aware are we so uh, and and regarding ethnicity and uh, ethics uh, fairness transparency these are some of the cornerstones on which the technology of tomorrow is going to stand so it is extremely important in that case that we build diversity and inclusion not only in the company not only in the uh, workforce but also in the technology that we are building I think, uh, did, did I answer your question, uh, Naveen? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Aparna. Thanks for your Naveen, thoughts. Naveen, I'll just add the recent thing that has happened, right? I mean, uh, I won't quote which company and all of this. When we roll out the products or when we roll out a, a, a web page, right? Uh, and we do a pilot uh, with some beta users, right? Um, this is a live example where it was rolled out and some 70,000 people were given access to uh, test it. But the usage of this was so low. That's because to Aparna's point, we actually didn't include the right people. So it's, it's a combination of technology and analytics and business, everything that needs to be included when we think of today's world. It's not in isolation or silos, right? Somebody in the technology world developed and threw it, and then somebody said, okay, let's just give it to somebody, some users and test it. It just didn't work. And when you roll back and look at it saying, what went wrong? It's just that the kind of users we sent this access to are the non-users or dormant users. It's uh, uh, certain functionalities that needed to be there is not there. So, Diversity and inclusion in every day's work that we do is an important element of success in today's world. Very well said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you no, know, we are running time. You know, just one sentence. Can yeah, I just take one ahead. sentence here? Right Please now? go ahead. Go for one it. Of the thing, one of the things that I have, you know, been looking at also is that have we becoming have we become too scientific actually in our data science world? Is there a place? for liberal arts to be part of the data science team, you know, so that's a lot, one of the questions that keeps on appearing again in my mind again and again. I thought I'd just share that. Uh, but over I think to you again, it now. is evolving, right? Because yeah. storytelling and creativity is a huge element that's missing in today's uh, data science world. And that is need, need of where we are reaching. Uh, when you ask a Tableau developer to develop, he will just put some buttons. But the UI UX element is completely missing, and that's not the what end users want, right? So yeah, to Amar's point, in fact, in my experience, I have had uh, uh, one of my managers who has had a, a, a PhD in psychology. Uh, this was back in the 2000s, and they did really well as uh, categorization of transaction experts at a bank. Uh, so really, the the liberal arts and the social sciences adds a different uh, perspective that can catapult the current, uh, the science and the engineering fields to have uh, to the next level for sure. So fantastic. Uh, the, in no, fact, probably just, when we no, no, 
I have just I don't one stop point. anybody. Go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Just one more point to add out here. Basically, when we say about diversity, many people mistaken uh, get it mistaken by, for you know gender diversity. Whereas we are not talking specific to gender diversity. We are talking about generational diversity. Okay, cultural diversity, racial diversity, gender diversity, all kind of diversities need to be taken into picture to identify the blind spots and then get it removed or as well to bring in ethics, fairness, and transparency out there. Wow, you have been uh, adding a few more definitions. And actually, uh, let me uh, switch over to the theme three and put you on spot, uh, Aparna. Uh, can I uh, ask if you have had any advice from a mentor that stuck with you? And if you can expand on that, since, since you have the mic, please go ahead. Uh, sure, so I'll uh, relate my uh, you know, experience or the one advice that I have got from got from my coaches, my mentors is about anti fragility. We all hear about resilience. We all hear about perseverance. But when the uncertainty, you know, strikes us, like uh, uh, Amar was telling some time back, that when in in the chaotic, in the uh, you know bad situations, when unexpected events hit us, how do we leverage uh, those events to convert them from adversities to opportunities? I think anti-fragility, being anti-fragile, taking the adversities into the positive direction and converting it into opportunities, that is something if we can work upon, I think that will be the best thing. So that is one of, one of the advice that I have got and uh, I, I try to implement it, but you know, not, not 100%, I'm yet to master that. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Let's take an audience question here. Uh, I see that uh, Vishal M has, uh, uh, has a very profound question here. What are the differentiator skills a professional data scientist should have versus a citizen data scientist? Uh, maybe I will direct it uh, to you, Vijay, and also if you can add uh, you know, the theme three, if you have gotten any advice uh, from a mentor that has stuck with you, uh, I think we will blend those two. Sure, sure. So, uh, just to make sure that I got the question right, uh, the differentiated skills between a professional data scientist and a citizen data scientist. Yes, yes. Probably a separator between a generalist and a specialist. Yeah. So, I think um, uh, I'm going back to one particular point, which uh, I think the team spoke about is the end journey or the end outcome that you need to achieve. Uh, when you're a specialized in data science, when you are specialized as data, in data analytics and every form of it is such, at some point your career path's going to be requesting you to move into two or three paths. One would be towards the business. So start making the transition to be in front of the customer. Second is continue that journey of being that architect to be defining solutions for the future of the organization. And the third one is a people management function. So you can grow by team sizes. So today, if you're leading a 50 member team, you grow to a hundred member team, et cetera. So eventually these, uh, all of you will move into one of these three frameworks. And I think the difference between a professional data scientist and a citizen data scientist is that if you choose to go towards the people management or the business role, you need to start looking at yourself, not just as a gender, you should start thinking of yourself as a generalist, see the outcome, see what are the things that involve in terms of dealing with people, et cetera. And when you're becoming that architectural function and you want to be an expert in the space and you become no known only because of the knowledge that you have in the space and that's when you become a citizen data scientist. I think that's my take this thing. To your point of advice, mentor, I think this is something which has always stuck with me and I've always believed in it. If you're comfortable in your job, then something's going wrong. So I think uh, this has always stuck with me that, you know, if things are too seemingly good for you, you know, nothing's happening, everything's good, et cetera, then something's brewing around you, which you're not privy to. Either technology is changing or uh, people are making decisions without your knowledge, uh, or you have been slated as that person who's, uh, you know, it's like the rook in the chess game, you know, you're stuck to a corner, you move in a very clear direction, front or back, side, et cetera. Uh, but the rook has an innate ability to castle up with the king, right? But only if it chooses two and there's nothing in between. So, you know, I think uh, if you're too comfortable in everything that you're doing at work, something's wrong. You might want to just keep your eye open. I've seen a lot of times throughout my career, people who felt that everything settled in, suddenly their job is just gone. So um, yeah. that's my two cents. 
I and think, I mean, uh, uh, just a uh, call out. Yeah. I might have to leave a little early, but I just want to thank the entire 3A team and all of you here. It's uh, fantastic. And any questions that may be directed at me, I'll be happy to take it offline at any point. So just want to call that out. So come on, folks, let the hard questions come in in the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, if I can just add to that, right? On a day-to-day yeah, -day basis, difference between uh, 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 general data scientists versus uh, uh, professional data scientists also evolves around what they are questioning about what they're doing, right? For example, when there's a problem, how do you scale from hundreds of images to millions to billions? is a question a professional data scientist would ask. Or how would you build a cloud API to serve the web front end? Is a professional data scientist question and, and not just building that model, right? Uh, whether it is metrics and to Aparna's point, how do you identify the potential biases? How do you scale it up? Is some of the, are some of the elements of a professional data scientist and they think holistically as well? Just my two cents. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in from my experience, I call this as the completing the matrix as well. So if you think about a two by two matrix, you can uh, let's think about the, the the rows here. You can go as deep as uh, uh, mastering these algorithms and the technology and so on. But you might be light on the columns, which are representative of the breadth of business acumen and uh, other uh, softer things. So how much do you want to go deep or wide? It is completely up to you to figure it out. Will you be able to complete the matrix? No, there is no AI expert uh, here, but you can have a very shallow, narrow matrix or a pretty wide matrix or somewhere in between. So it is up to you, each one of you, to think about how do you complete that matrix. So fantastic question, uh, multiple answers there. Thank you so much. So let me go on to Amar uh, next, and uh, I will lead off with a question from the audience and uh, with the theme, please go ahead and uh, uh, share your knowledge nugget from your mentor as well. So the question is, data engineering is a new capability in the world of AI and analytics. Does one morph from data science to being a data engineer or stick to AI? Interesting question, actually, and you know, it brings about a little interesting perspective as well. Uh, and it's really a conundrum. So, one of the things that we all in the panel at different points in time have shared is that we are becoming a specialist. You know, there is a, there are a lot of functions and somebody to be master of everything. And herein lies the ironical thing. If I look at the journey 20 years back, there were people who were actually responsible for data, and there were people who were using the data. So for example, if I were to make a statement that I am an IT challenged person, probably it might have been fair, you know, because I know how to use data, but how is data really getting into that Oracle data warehouse or into that SQL server? I don't know about it. But now if I say that it's a career limiting move that I'm doing it. A technology, probably, you know, it's not that Data science, you know, data is becoming everywhere. It is that technology has made so much inroad into each and every aspect of our life that one cannot remain away from it. If I have to be a good data scientist, I need to be aware about the different data sources. There is an element. Data itself is actually a specialized function in its own. So you, while you might not be completely in that, but at least, see, there are really three different functions to there, and two main functions are one is the data engineer and one is the data scientist. Data scientists, should they not know about data? No, we don't live in that world. You need to be reasonably well aware about what really is happening. With us. You might not know about graph technology. You might not know about edge computing, which is okay, but at least you have that inclination to learn. And the same thing happens for data engineer also. They also should know what are the different algorithms that are getting used. Bagging, boosting, there is always something new happening there. You know, so that is where, while we say that we are becoming a specialist, but in this specialist world, it is even more important that we know what others are doing. So I've tried to share my perspective. I don't know whether that answers the question or not. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it uh, triggers one more thought. They always say that the marriages are made in heaven. 
but looks like if happy marriages are made in here, so it's it will be between the data scientists and the engineers. So that'll be perfect. Yeah, that's that's a, a diagram, right? I mean, it's it, it always will be a Venn diagram where you have to have to know that piece. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. you are trying to live in an environment where you are creating a boundary for yourself. Mm. Right? So, so I think one, one needs to always say that there will always be that Venn diagram aware and you got to know that I'm, I'm more better in this. I want to explore this more. Uh, but but it's not that you can be you know uh, you, you you can you should not and you cannot run away from yeah. the other aspect. That triggers a thought with me, you know, Ibran. And somebody who is actually siloed will never be successful. Yeah. And what you are saying really is hinting to that the world that we are living going in into is actually so much uncertain, and that is where you have to break out of your silo and get into other places. Very right. Uh, coming back to the other question with Naveen had said, you know, what is the best advice? Um, I will say I've been actually a little bit unfortunate in that regard. One of the things I wish I had was, I hope I had a good mentor. In fact, I had a mentor. I probably did not have that, whether it was my nature or whatever it is, you know. So being a little bit of an independent, but I think, you know, getting a mentor, at, at uh, in, especially during your early part of a career journey, when you are young, that is very, 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 very important. I think to all the audience, if there is one thing that they should do, definitely is get a mentor. And that is where I think 3AI also is helping quite a lot, where they're helping, you know, not just the students, but also the young professionals, they're trying to get them to mentor. The soft skills are extremely important. Well, we have talked about so much of Python and data part or something. It is your soft skills which will actually determine how successful you are. Python can be like you know one of the my co-panelists had mentioned. It. Python can be mastered by somebody so easily, so quickly, but it is your attitude which cannot be mastered by others. It is your attitude which will. Those would be my perspective. I really wish I had that mentor part, you know, and that is something which I feel in this uncertain world will definitely be the difference between success and failure. Over to you, Nathan. Thank you so much. Amar. I think uh, uh, it goes beyond uh, that. We are not acting here in on an individual capacity at all. We cannot call ourselves as analysts. We belong to a community and that's by that extension. We belong to this broader family. So very well said. Uh, Amar. So Imran uh, over to you. Uh, would you like to share something that has uh, uh, that you have been inspired by from your mentor? Sure, and I think. Uh... You know, two pieces. Uh, one, obviously, I've, I've already perhaps shared a few snippets on you know different aspects of that issue tree and pieces. These are all pieces coming in from my uh, mentors or experiences. Uh, so I think at the end, as you're building your career in data science, data engineering, business consulting, <clears throat> trust will be the fundamental of it. And given that you as individuals and we as panelists at times get most closest to the data. People think of us and reside us and saying, okay, I trust you the most. And the ability to, you know, be cognizant and be careful of that trust is one. And the second is the ability of how you are able to communicate and storytelling so that the trust continues to be in there. So to me is storytelling trust because you have access to and you will get access to information which is, is, is phenomenal. And as this data science and, and now obviously we are spending time and building it up of uh, you know the, the efficacy and uh, all of these uh, different aspects that data science will or uh, AI will bring in. I think uh, how you tell the stories that you continue to build the trust in the people, in the user, in the uh, end decision makers, and uh, yeah, the the trust factor. So these would be my two uh, pieces that were told to me, and you know, are are uh, extremely extremely important. So which is what I would share it out as a as a giveaway. Absolutely, I think uh, uh, both of them are absolutely important. In fact, uh, trust is one of the most common. 
uh, uh, adjectives that shows up in the most uh, vision and the uh, mission and the goal statements across uh, the companies in the world. So, and the second thing that reminds me, communication and storytelling is absolutely important. Uh, Chris Arnold, many of you know who uh, uh, recently passed away, but he has been the data whisperer. In one of uh, the IIT uh, speeches, a student asked, what are a uh, few things that analysts in the future should uh, uh, master? Which you know the people were expecting Python, Anaconda, Jupiter, Hadoop, Spark, what have you. He said two things: you should be able to write well, and you should be able to speak well. So the communication emphasis is uh, is, is you know he said it in in very crisp words. All right, so uh, we have uh, another question coming in from the audience. As a student, how do you decide which role to go for, data engineer or data analyst. Uh, Sarah, if I may uh, throw this question over to you and also uh, lead us off with uh, uh, any tidbits from your mentor. Sure, Please. sure. So I think uh, you heard everybody speak about understand yourself, right? Understand what are you good at? If you're good at numbers, number crunching, understanding this whole data element, and, and you're really inclined towards business, then data scientist is the path, right? But if you really like ever-changing technology, the technology landscape, you really look at data lineage and understand, make sense of that whole thing, then it's the data engineering part. There is, I mean, you you will have to figure out what really works for you by understanding your interest, your aspiration, and your strength. Um, and and then in the end again, like uh, Imran said, it is a Venn diagram. You need to know all elements of and some elements of all of these things. But which path to take clearly depends on your interest and alignment towards it. And you can swap these later, especially from data engineer to you can move to data scientist. But to start with, you need to know what is your interest. Um, I hope that answers, Navi. And um, as, far, as far as my mentor goes, I think I am very thankful to my managers and mentors. And today I am where I am and able to do what I'm doing because, because of pure guidance that I've got from them, right? So there are three components that I've got mentored on. One is on people, the other one is on being professional, and the other one is a personal uh, mentorship. Um, on, be, on people, I think the best advice I've got is take care of your number ones. Um, we always have high performers. Taking care of them actually leads to creating more high performers in the team. And on the professional front, um, I used to be a very quiet person and the Indian education system makes you think, can I ask a question? Can I express my opinion? Um, because you cannot go wrong in the education system. Uh, one of my mentors said, if you have an opinion, talk about it because when you are in a room, you need to be useful. And then I've not stopped talking after that. And the other thing is, um, uh, it's also inherent nature. And then this mentor also told me, um, I think Vijay alluded to that saying, you know, if this status quo, um, there's something wrong. So embrace being uncomfortable and always think about how you craft your story to what Imran said is another great advice I've got from a mentor. And on the personal friend, I think the best advice I've got is choose your spouse wisely. <laughs> That's amazing. So uh, uh, we have uh, uh, covered from Venn diagrams to uh, multiple uh, thoughts here. So uh, great insights. So let's see if we have a uh, few more questions uh, from the audience. What co competencies one need to build to grapple with changing roles in AI and analytics? So. Um, Anyone open floor? Anybody want to take this yeah, question? I can, I can answer that, and uh, <clears throat> and again, it will be similar to a little bit of uh, you know earlier statements that people have made out here, which is you got to 
forgot to really touch upon the other, all the aspects of it. You know, the data engineer, and I personally see from where I have come now, right now, when I was talking here, and I'm like, okay, these are all students coming in uh, when I started off with, and you know, was a data engineer. I was building up, because as a start, typically you're like, okay, you know, let me pull the SQL, write the SQL codes, get the data in, is it ready? Uh, you know, and then we start to build up small uh, models, and that time, you know, just building up these regression models itself was a was an interesting thing. You know, forget about doing neural networks and things like that. Most of the time was all about how can I access to that data in a much more speedy manner. So your data engineering skills are getting more and more. And then I said, no, I'm I'm interested in the solving of you know these these equations. And I said, okay, let me move into the data science um, area part of it. And that's where I learned, okay segmentation and others this is this is nice because now i'm able to relate to the end question and as i move further into the journey i said no i think i'm more uh, liking of answering the so what and and then building up the question so it is about you know experiencing these different pieces because till the time you don't experience you will be in that aspect of i don't know it and which something that you don't know you don't know it, but you can't answer that so you got to touch that, and uh, yeah, so that's that's would be my, uh, you know, answer to uh, that. Yeah, I, I, if yeah. I may, if I may add to Imran's point, basically, so from the soft skill perspective, it is extremely important to be agile and adaptable. The technology landscape is changing in a very fast pace. So until and unless I, my attitude is being agile and adaptable, I won't be able to pick it up. The second part is also important that once you develop the model, it is not over. There are certain assumptions, there are certain nuances of the data on which the model is built, and that is prone to change over a period of time. How do we validate those models? How do we assure that the model accuracy that I was getting before the COVID period, that was before March 2020, is actually holding good after March 2020? So this is don't think that once you have uh, you know developed the model using Python or uh, R or any such language and uh, it's done. It's an ever evolving proper, uh, process. You have to validate it. You have to see it in the real time scenario, whether the assumptions, the underlying data holds still good or it has changed. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Imran and Aparna. Uh, I'm just looking at the monitor here. If we have uh, more questions, I think we have covered most of it. Also, we have three minutes. So. Uh, let me try to summarize. Uh, uh, can I say one thing actually? You know, so can I, yeah. So one of the things, and there are actually uh, at the cost of confusing the audience because there are so many advice which is coming in. Uh, so let me say one more thing. One of the skill, especially in this startup era, where a lot of people are, and you know, Imran has recently taken the jump from there. Uh, one of the thing I will say is that it's actually a very beautiful thing which is there. Uh, where you need to be taking care of the nitty gritty and the operational aspect, yet at the other side also be a have the capability to look at a 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 feet. I am reminded of one of the program at Sinai uh, when ESPN completed 25 years of its existence. I happened to be in the US and they had actually a one hour program where they were telecasting a football game. And through that program, they were showing what are the technical aspects that they have to manage to really telecast a game. There are so many different cameras. A split second, you have to take a decision which cameras feed need to be showed live to the audience. It's really, you know, seeing that the last thing on my mind was the football game, American football game, you know. Yet, when the producer afterwards was asked, What's your take over the last, what has happened over the last three months, three years? You know, the thing is that it saw that touchdown, the manner in which it had happened. He didn't even talk about the technical difficulties. So that was a perfect example of why he was doing some, everything right at the operational level. His eyes were fixed at what is really happening at the larger level. And that is why the ESPN program telecasts are so nice. You know, so uh, at the cost of taking time, you know, yeah, Navi. Um, no, I think uh, that that brought in a lot of concepts that we discussed uh, as well, Amar. You know, keep your eye on the customer all the time. Keep your eye on your short-term as well as long-term career and have a continuum. 
to it, right? And also uh, think about the so what. Don't get distracted uh, with uh, you know the information, right? And we you talked about the knowledge is free. How do you think about the quality of data? So, uh, folks, when we go back to the three questions that we started out with. How does one chart the most optimal path uh, for to be successful in the field of AI? Can AI be mastered at school or working on cool projects? How do AI crats think, learn, and execute? Is there something called an AI mindset? I am positive that we have answered a lot of these questions and beyond. And at, uh, from a summary perspective, I would like to think about it as a tripod. So there are three legs to this tripod. One is, what do companies look for the second one is, how does we chart our career? And the third thing is the list of technology, and that list can change. The companies can change, the careers can change, the, the tools and the techniques can change, but you have, you are the centroid of the triangle. You are in the center looking around these three uh, vertices of a triangle, and it is completely up to you uh, to pick up how much you want to deep dive or how, how much you want to float and chart your career. So with that, a lot of best wishes uh, to everybody. A huge round of applause for our panelists and uh, a warm thank you to 3AI for bringing uh, this platform and bringing it all together. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, 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 Thanks Tria. Thanks, 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 Bye. Bye. Great weekend. Thanks, Naveen, for driving this through interesting set of questions uh, really appreciate it yeah thank you yeah. appreciate that yeah. definitely very well coordinated very well done Naveen. you know so definitely enjoyed it. thank you so much and thank you so much to my co my pleasure Bye. thanks all bye bye